brothers and sisters in Christ. It started with a small sore on the man's foot. That's how it began for a man that I knew. By the time, however, I was standing over him in a hospital room, it wasn't just a small sore on the bottom of his foot. As I looked at him lying in that hospital bed, I could tell it was a lot more serious. That sore had become an infection, and the infection had gone septic. That means it had gotten into his bloodstream. And as I looked at him, puffed up and swollen, I could see the reaction his body was having to that infection. So that man talked to me about what had happened. He said that the doctors were fairly confident the antibiotics they had put him on would be able to deal with the infection that was in his bloodstream. However, those antibiotics would not be enough to deal with the infection in his foot. That man explained what had happened with that infection. He also showed me what had happened with it. That infection that started with a small sore on the bottom of his foot had worked its way through his foot, eating a hole all the way through it. In fact, some of the tissue had started to die. This man told me that he needed to have an operation. The operation the doctors wanted to perform would have one goal and one goal only, to remove the part of the foot that was infected. This man needed that surgery, and he needed it to happen quickly before that gangrene started to spread into the rest of his body and threaten his life. Two of our lessons for tonight from God's Word warn us about the danger of false teaching and false teachers. But those aren't the only two places in God's Word that speak about that danger. There are many others, but I'd like you to think about another one of those warnings for just a moment. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to a young man named Timothy, warned about the danger of false teaching in this way. He wrote, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. After seeing exactly how serious gangrene is and how seriously the medical community deals with gangrene, I gained a new appreciation for Scripture's warning against the gangrene of false teaching. Doctors don't mess around with gangrene. They don't treat it with kid gloves. They don't deal with it as some minor matter. The way they approach it isn't to say, well, here's a couple of pills, take those, and we'll see what happens. No, they deal with gangrene quickly and decisively. And they use one of the most extreme things that you can do in the medical community. They cut off part of the body, something that's irreversible. The bottom line is clear. Your Savior Jesus wants you to know that false teaching is dangerous. False teaching is a very dangerous problem, and yet, if you think about that first lesson that we read earlier tonight, it sets the danger of false teaching and false teachers kind of alongside of God's word in sort of a comparison kind of way. For instance, in that lesson from Jeremiah, we find statements like these. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. I did not speak, son the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let him who has my word speak it faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat? Do you think about those comparisons between false teaching and God's word? I'd like you to ask yourself, what's more dangerous? What's more dangerous, that, that gangrene of false teaching or the medicine of God's word? What's more dangerous, those empty lies and delusions of false prophets or the, the satisfying wheat of God's word? What's more dangerous? 
The answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? But I want to be kept in obvious tonight. I'm going to actually go ahead and say it. God's word is more dangerous. You heard me right. God's word is more dangerous. After all, isn't God's word like a fire? Isn't it like a hammer that breaks rock in pieces? I mean, a fire is a dangerous thing. A hammer is a dangerous thing. And God's word, too, is a dangerous thing. Let me help you, let me help you grasp just how dangerous God's word is. The man who wrote the words of our text, Jeremiah, was a fairly young guy when he began his work as a prophet. In fact, when God called him to serve that nation of Israel, Jeremiah tried to get out of it. He tried to excuse himself from it by saying this, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. Not only was Jeremiah a pretty young guy with the challenges that came with that, he also faced what seems to have been a lot more opposition than normal for God's prophets. In fact, the opposition was so intense that at least on at least two different occasions, Jeremiah was ready to quit. He wanted to just hang it up and stop being a prophet. On one of those occasions, this is what he had to say. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out for putting violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will remain silent, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That word of God was a dangerous thing for Jeremiah. It was dangerous because it burned in his heart like a fire. Jeremiah had a zeal burning in his heart because of that word of God, a zeal for the people around him. He saw them caught in their false teachings, and he couldn't stay quiet. Jeremiah couldn't contemplate the, the punishment that awaited those people and, and just ignore it. He couldn't think about that and just say, well, I guess that's what's going to happen. No, that fire of God's word burned in his heart with a love for those people so that he had to speak out and he had to do it even though whenever he opened his mouth, it brought him ridicule. It brought him difficulty. It brought him pain even. That word of God is no less dangerous today. It is just as much a fire in your hearts as it was a fire in Jeremiah's heart. Think back to Pentecost for a minute. Perhaps some of you remember how we sang on that day of Pentecost these words. Give to your word impressive power, that in our hearts from this good hour as fire it may be glowing, that in true Christian unity we faithful witnesses may be your glory ever showing. O mighty rock, O source of life, let your dear word in doubt and strife in us be brightly burning, that we be faithful unto death and live in love and holy faith from you true wisdom learning. That same word of God that blazed as a fire in Jeremiah's heart, it blazes in your hearts too. That word of God, it burns as a fire inside of you, a fire of love for the people around you, the people in this world who are enslaved by sin, a fire that wants to set them free. That fire of God's word, it burns in your heart. It burns with a desire to help cure those people who are infected with the gangrene of false teaching. That word of God is a fire that's inside of your hearts, and it can't be shut up there. It's not a fire that can stay there. It's a fire that has to pour out in the way you speak and in the way you act. And that fire is dangerous. Because when it comes out in love for other people, sometimes it brings with it ridicule or difficulty or pain. But that's not the only thing that makes that word of God a dangerous fire. Satan knows how dangerous that word is. He knows just how dangerous and devastating that word of God is to his kingdom. Why do you think he employs so many false teachers? Why do you think he has, has raised up over the centuries so many false teachings? He wants to flood this world with his lies. He wants to quench that fire of God's word with a deluge, a downpour of lies about God. 
He wants God's people to forget God's name. He wants you to forget who God is, your Savior. He wants you to forget what God has done, paid for your sins. Satan wants to make Christians forget that. Because he knows that word is not only a fire in the hearts of believers, but that word of God is also a hammer. You see, Satan's kingdom is built on the rock, the hardness of the sinful human heart. And what does a hammer do? It breaks rock to pieces. God's word is like a hammer that breaks rock to pieces. The people of Jeremiah's day, they were pretty rock-like. They were very stubborn in their rebellion against God. When Jeremiah went to preach to them and to warn them about the dangers of their false teachings, those people of Israel pretty much blew Jeremiah off. In fact, they even went so far as to claim that their problem wasn't their unfaithfulness to God. They actually said to Jeremiah that their problem was that they weren't being faithful enough to their false gods. They weren't giving enough attention to the false teachings and the false prophets that were around them. They needed to ignore God even more and listen to those false teachers even more than they were already. And so God let the hammer of his word fall on those people through the preaching of Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied that they would experience plague, famine, and sword. If they would not repent, they would experience death and even exile. And when those people refused to listen, all those things happened. That nation of Israel went into exile in Babylon for 70 years. And during that 70-year period, that hammer of God's word, it did its work on their hearts. When they actually came back from Babylon, they were different people. They didn't come back to rebuild their idols, but they came back to rebuild the temple of the Lord. They didn't come back to restart worship of false gods. They came back to restart worship of the true God. The hearts that those people had taken with them into exile were different than the hearts that they came back from exile with. People today are no less rock-hearted than those Israelites. Oh, maybe the false teachings are a little different. The false gods that people worship are different. But it's striking how similar they are. People may not sacrifice their children to Chemosh or to Molech. Maybe you've never even heard those names of false gods before. But today people are still willing to sacrifice their children to the false gods of convenience or financial security. People may not bow down to idols that are covered with gold or silver. They've kind of cut out the middleman. People today are very often willing to bow down to gold and silver and all the things that money and wealth can buy. But even though people aren't any less hard-hearted, God's word is no less a hammer than it was in the days of Jeremiah. And, and you as Christians shouldn't be afraid to use that hammer of God's word. After all, what's going to change people's hearts? Is it finally some law that our government is going to pass? Or is it, is it Christians preaching God's law that convicts people's hearts of sin? What's going to change people's hearts? from hearts of stone to living hearts of faith? Is it going to be a winning smile on your part? Is it going to be some kind words that you say? Or is it going to be the wonderful and joyful message of a Savior from sin? A God who loves this world so much that he came to die on the cross for us. That word of God is just as much a hammer today in your hands as it was in the hands of Jeremiah. And when you as Christians use that word of God, Satan's kingdom is destroyed. I'm a dad, and I've got a couple of daughters, and one of the realities of having daughters is that you tend to kill a lot of pups. 
whenever there's a bug that my girls see, they cry for dad, and I'm very happy to go and to take care of that bug for them. But sometimes, either as I'm taking care of that bug, or maybe before or after, I'll remind my daughters of something that I think is kind of important for them to realize. They're a lot bigger than that bug. And so they can do a lot more damage to that bug than it can do to them. False teaching is dangerous. And we should never treat it as anything less than the spiritual gangrene it is. But when false teaching is set next to God's word, it's nothing more than a bug. You see, God's word is truly dangerous and powerful to Satan. That word of God is a fire that burns in the hearts of believers with love for fallen sinners. And that word of God is a hammer that believers have to crush that power of Satan's kingdom. May God grant that you would always flee from the danger of false teaching, but that even more you would cling to that word of God, that word that makes you far more dangerous to Satan. Amen. Please stand. Now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith with Christians globally using the words of the Apostles' Creed. They're found on page 41 in the front of the hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may actually remain standing. We're going to go right to, to our prayers. We'll join in the responsive prayer of the church on page 42. In our prayers tonight, we'll remember a couple of members who are celebrating birthdays, Lois Needhammer and also Tracy Wakefield. Also, we'll remember Gary and Lois Needhammer who are celebrating their anniversary this week. And also, we'll remember Ralph Shoemaker, who was hospitalized last week with an infection. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth and displace and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth, where there are wars, may there be peace, where there is hatred, let it be healed, where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help them. Heavenly Father, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. This evening, we rejoice with Lois and Tracy at the gift of life that you have given them here on this earth. We thank you for the blessings you have given them physically to sustain that life. We thank you most of all, though, that you have given them spiritual life through faith in Jesus. We ask that you would continue to be with them and bless them. 
give them all the things they need for a long and prosperous life here on this earth, and also all the things they need so that they may someday enjoy eternal life with you in heaven. Heavenly Father, we also give thanks with Gary and Lois for the gift of, of the years of marriage that you have given to them so far together. We ask that they would daily grow in their love for one another. May that love be modeled on the love that Jesus has shown to us. We ask that you would continue to be with them in all times and circumstances and bring them closer to each other and closer to you. Heavenly Father, you are also the God of all comfort. This evening, we ask that you would be with Ralph Shoemaker. Grant that the doctors and nurses who tend to him would have skill and that the treatments they administer would have success. May he quickly recover from his infection. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our time, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way we please things in your sight. Amen. We also pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. 